organization. It's not just a uh, club like many of the other clubs that we do work with, which makes us somewhat unique in this space in our partnerships with the Ministry of Natural Resources, uh, Grand River Conservation Authority, because we can actually apply for a lot of funding opportunities that other organizations or clubs cannot apply for because we have full charitable status. It also makes our organization a little bit more high maintenance in terms of CRA filings, tax proceeding, all of that sort of fun stuff. So it's a bit of a, it's a good thing and a, and a challenge at times as well. So why does Friends of the Grand exist? So we, we exist, we were kind of born uh, in the early 1990s, we're organized to develop, promote, and implement projects on the upper stretch of the Grand River watershed. So I'll show you a map of our stretch that we focus on. We've got about a 27, 28 kilometer stretch, basically from West Montrose, Ontario, up to Bellwood Lake, for the most part. Um, our goal as a charitable organization is to not only work on kind of the ecology and health of the Grand River, but to provide uh, educational opportunities and engage as many stakeholders as possible in the in the Grand River watershed. So I mentioned we're a nonprofit organization. We were established in 1995. Actually, started as a member as a chapter of Trout Unlimited Canada. Uh, eventually, again, I wasn't part of the organization in the early 90s, but eventually moved to becoming our own organization. Our goal is to continue to kind of fundraise uh, in order to con continue to improve the upper watershed. So we focus mostly on fundraising through memberships and, and uh, fundraising events. I'll speak a little bit about our Grand Opportunities event every year, which is our largest fundraiser. Uh, but it's an area that our organization can really focus on. So one of the things that I'm kind of working on as board chair with the organization is the idea of focusing more on kind of core competencies of a, of a charitable organization. So bringing in people with certain skill sets like fundraising, marketing, communications, uh, any sort of legal background, accounting. So uh, I'm sure some of you know some of the members of Friends of the Grand River, the Larry McGrattans, Ian Martin, Rob Heels, all of those guys. We have like 12 board members who could outfish just about any charity in the world, I promise you that. But we are missing a bunch of skill sets from uh, from a skills matrix that we need to bring to the table in order to keep growing our organization. Because we want to keep growing the pie, we don't want to just be who we are. <clears throat> we are an action-oriented group, that's how I got involved with Friends of the Grand River, is uh, I just started showing up to fish stocking and tree planting and rolling rocks and doing that sort of cool stuff, but garbage pickup. Uh, I have kids, nine and seven and three, and they love to do all of those things with me. So uh, that's how I started getting involved with Friends of the Grand River. Actually, I got involved about 13 years ago on the Conestoga River. I don't know if anyone knows Brad Nahr, uh, he, but he oversees the Conestoga River enhancement uh, crew there. So. Uh, they do an unbelievable job, and really it's Brad and Archie, it's really the leader of two that works on the Conestoga River work, and uh, they are superheroes, trust me. If you ever want to have an insanely awesome fish stocking experience, I mean the Grand is great, but the Conestoga is amazing because they have uh, canoe stocking with big live walls in the middle of the canoe and maps of the pools that you jump out of, so you kind of meet up with the m &R truck and they give you 500 fish. And then you go down the river and you stop at the spots on your map and you hop out in your waders and unload 150 and then you, you know, an hour later you meet up with the ministry truck again and they fill you back up. It's, it's an amazing experience. Uh, super fun day. Plus then you know where all the fish are in the middle of the water. <laughs> Uh, so the Grand River and the Conestoga River, but the Grand River is a tailwater fishery. So what is a tailwater fishery? This is probably an audience that already knows what a tailwater fishery is, but it's a, it's a low level release dam. So I think I have the next picture is the Shan Dam. So the Shan Dam, which is the dam that drains Bellwood Lake into the upper stretches of the Grand <coughs> River in Bellwood, um, was built in 1942. In 1972, they did a retrofit on this dam that turned it from high level release, so this would be the top of the lake, to a low level water release. They put turbines in, and now the water is actually released from 60 to 80 feet deep in the lake. And that's what makes the tailwater fishery so successful, is the water is cold year round. So 
we see spikes in water temperature. Um, usually the month of August is relatively unfishable. Uh, it's not safe for the brown trout. There's still fishermen and fisherwomen out there at times, but we work a lot on education in that regard. But for the most part, we can maintain a water temperature below 68 degrees for every other period of the, of the summer months uh, because of this low level release, which is, uh, which is what makes it sustainable as a trout water fishery. So prime trout water is between 55 and 65 degrees is kind of prime temperature for trout. And the upper tail water of the Grand lives in that temperature range for 75% of the summer months. So what does the upper Grand look like? So this is the upper stretch of the river here. Um, I'll walk you through here, but there's the Shan Dam up there, and this is West Monroe. So this is the kind of 27 kilometer stretch of river that Friends of the Grand would view as our own river. Now we work with other groups and support other stretches of the river and other watersheds. If you fished this upper section before, um, this section is basically bedrock and it's very dam controlled. So with the Shan Dam right here, there's almost no feeder creeks through this upper stretch right here and it's basically bedrock. So one of the trade secrets that I'll share with this room, because you guys are awesome, is if we get 100 millimeters of rain, that stretch of river is still gonna fish awesome. There's no sediment runoff, there's no creeks dumping dirt in there, it's dam controlled. Uh, so everywhere from kind of Fergus down can be totally blown out, and this stretch right here will still fish great. So keep that our secret, okay? So the middle stretch here is, this is kind of limestone out, outcrops and higher gradient. So this is where you get into the Alora Gorge. Uh, this is where the Irvine River, which is the bigger tributary in this stretch of the river, dumps in. Uh, so it's high, steep banks, still a lot of limestone. And this basically goes from kind of the bottom end of Fergus to just past the bottom end of Alora. Beautiful scenery in there if you haven't fished it. It can be a little, <clears throat> a little trickier waiting for sure. And then the lower reach tailwater is a wider profile. So the, wa the river starts to widen out a little bit. You've got kind of farmer, rolling farmer's fields and uh, trees and forests all around there. Uh, this is unbelievable dry fly fishing water. Uh, I'll bring, always bring it back to flesh fishing, why not? Um, really slow, big, deep pools and uh, awesome for Hendrickson's earlier in the year. So that's, I just showed you guys my reverse order style of fishing as I start early in the season down here and slowly work my way up there following the bugs basically. And usually it, if you see the bugs down at the lower stretch, it's five to seven days before they get up. Yeah, usually about that. Somewhere in there I would say. All depends on the weather. Um, if I go, I should probably go back actually. So a good chunk of the, the river that I just showed you is a no kill zone. Okay, so all fish have to be released. You have to fish with barbless, uh, single barbless hooks, artificial uh, bait only. So no live bait. And so if you look on this map, all of the, it's kind of hard to see, the pink river stretches. Those are all of your no-kill zones throughout the watershed. So you can see what has created this world-class fishery has been predominantly the catch and release uh, regulations, the special regulations we have here. And that's, that's work that uh, Friends of the Grand in combination with the Ministry of Natural Resources accomplished many years ago and has uh, continued to kind of hold true through the test of time. So you can see kind of in the city, the city of Fergus, and uh, the town of Alora. I live in Fergus, so you know Alora. Um, those are the those are the stretches where the kind of uh, the no kill zone uh, is it's open. It's regular regulations through those stretches. The ministry does want to promote fishing. Their goal is to promote more fishing, not become more restrictive on fishing. So those are the opportunities for kind of all anglers. So the Grand River Tailwater Fisheries Management Plan. So there is a fisheries management plan. You can find it online if you Google search it. Uh, but we do have a plan that was established in the early 2000s between a number of stakeholder organizations. It is a plan that we are urging the Ministry of Natural Resources and Fisheries to help us rewrite or for them to allow us to help them rewrite it, let's say. 
because we believe it's time. It's simply out of date, and uh, a lot of the science that was put behind that plan is was done 20 years ago now. Uh, was there a sort of bonus to increasing some of the deep water uh, pools? Absolutely, yeah. Um, if I were to go back to that middle section, actually in the last three years there's been two significant projects, about a half a million dollars worth of work done into dredging. Uh, we dredged pools in partnership with the ministry, uh, GRCA and some local partners. We dredged out some long stretches of pools. We call them the EP projects because we've got, there's 10 lined up and this was EP 8, 9 and 10. So it was three stretches, but done in two kind of tranches. Uh, we, we created overwintering pools. We brought the banks in about six feet on each side. We downed a bunch of trees and filled the whole thing with gravel, uh, like nice big river rock gravel stone to provide some more over overwintering habitat for fish down there because we were finding that the, the kills, uh, the kill rate was really high due to anchor ice uh, just because of the type of water and the lack of deep pools. So. Yeah, the work has started down there. We have plans to move our way up the watershed. Now it's just a matter of funding. And uh, I don't know if any of you are members or follow Friends of the Grand on Facebook or anything, but we've just recently conducted a, an online survey for people that have been on the water. Uh, so we've gone through, we got over 100 responses, which was great. And <clears throat> we've gone out to all of the professional anglers, so any guides that are on the water more than 50 days a year and asked for their kind of affidavits on uh, on what their experience was like this year. And across the board, we are seeing an increase in heron, osprey, uh, kingfisher, an increase in beavers, and decrease in fish. So, like across the board. Uh, so it's actually part of our business case right now that we will be packaging and taking to the ministry this fall to say, the old fish management plan said 24,000 fish was the right number, but that old fish management plan was based on science from 20 years ago. And here's our kind of observations from the current experience. So they said that there are more fish available if we can make a case for them. So that's our game plan. We've also, over the last five years, we've snuck in about 5,000 wild fish in small tributaries uh, from the Credit River strain. So we're putting wild fish, non-hatchery fish in there. So I, I believe there's some level of reproduction going on there, but we don't have science to prove that basically. But I don't see why there wouldn't be. And we've focused on those areas down where we've done that restoration work because it is kind of prime spawning ground for those fish. Uh, I mentioned Ministry of Natural Resources, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Grand River Cons. These are all members of the fish management plan. Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters and Trout Unlimited. So we meet on a, about a bi-monthly to quarterly basis with all of these groups at the ministry offices. Uh, and we look at the whole watershed from basically Bellwood Lake all the way down to Lake Erie. And we do shuffle resources around to support each other. And as I mentioned earlier, we are the one charity of all of those groups. So we often apply for funding through ourselves and flow it through to the other channels to work. Uh, fish stocking. So fish stocking is certainly our kind of premier event, let's call it, of the year. We get a ton of volunteers out. Usually the first, say second, first full week, but second week of May, Monday, Tuesday, we stock the Grand River with 24,000 uh, fingerling trout. And then Wednesday, Thursday, we stock the Conestoga River, usually with about 14,000 fish. And then sometimes we get leftover fish on the Friday. The last couple of years, we've had brood stock, which has not been my favorite, but I'm talking like huge, huge brown trout that have been kind of, they've been the moms in the hatchery for the last four years. And they're, they're rolling into the river at like 26, 27 inches and 12 pounds. They're kind of like a freshwater manatee. <laughs> So anyways, we don't have any more of those and quite frankly, I'm okay with that. We've only put, we've put about 180 of them in the grand in the last couple of years. And uh, if you hook onto one of those, you know, because you're going to spend a half an hour with your rod corked and probably not land it. Um, these are my daughters from behind. I bring them out to fish stocking every day. If you guys have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, it's an awesome experience. Just some more, let's see, there's my Minnie Mouse daughter right there. You can even wear a Minnie Mouse hat while you're fish stocking, it's pretty cool. 
Hi, you can see Glenn from the Ministry of Natural Resources here. I don't know who, has anyone done fish stocking before? Yeah, awesome. It is a incredibly awesome experience. Um, it's super cool to give back in this way and your arms will be ready to fall off after about half a day. So, educational seminars. So we do have, we have kind of our core kind of educational event called Grand Opportunities that we do the first Saturday of June every year at Bellwood Lake. So we use this as a bit of a fundraiser, also uh, an opportunity for our network to get together, uh, the fly fishing community, and, uh, and have a good time and ha have free seminars. So we have phenomenal seminars at these things from uh, some of the best fly tires, fly fishermen and women. We do women's only classes, we do on the water classes, casting competitions for fun. Uh, raffles while we're there. Last year we had five of kind of the best fly tires you can imagine that we could kind of scrounge up. Jay Passmore, Nick Groves, uh, a couple other gentlemen from Grindstone and Drift Outfitters. And all day long they sat there and tied different flies and loaded a box and by the time the day was done like this was a you know big box just loaded with flies that we were pulled off you know five bucks a ticket and it was probably a eight hundred dollar box by the time this thing was done so it's a really cool opportunity barbecue anyway it's a very fun event so whatever the first saturday is in june put it in your calendars Six. now the sixth yep. okay june 6th this year and uh it's a it's a super fun event and we usually last year we counted about 150 people attending so uh, we're working on bringing other organizations out as well. We've had rowing clubs out, we've had Sage reps out uh, the last couple of years. We had Trout Unlimited out last year. Uh, collect, we went and collected a bunch of the bug life on friends are on the Grand River and shared kind of some of the bugs in its casing and hatched form. Next year we're planning on doing an electroshocking and bringing up an aquarium so you can see all of the other kind of life that lives in the, in the river there. Uh, tree planting. So we do on the both the Conestoga and the Grand, we do one tree planting a year, but we would like to do more. That's part of our planning right now is to start doing more tree planting as we move forward. Again, this is usually just before a trout opener earlier in the year, so you'll have to kind of wait and wait for a date. But uh, as you all know, uh, trees provide shade for our river, which cools the water temperature down and uh, helps the water and the trout all the way down. We also have our, uh, our kiosks. So on the, on the Grand River itself, we have 12 access points, nine that we manage ourselves. Uh, you wouldn't believe the number of garbage bags we collect in a year, over 500 garbage bags. We have uh, one volunteer that runs up and down the river every single week uh, with a trailer. And, uh, and loads these up. So we maintain all of those access points from road to river. We've installed staircases at a number of the steeper banks that are hundreds of thousands of dollars for some of these staircases. And then now we've got volunteers that go out on a bi-weekly basis with their chainsaw and you know, weed whackers and make sure that those paths are cleared for you guys. So moving forward, I think I'm, I think I'm wrapping up my presentation now, I can't remember. Um, we are looking to grow, so uh, we have maintained this stable of kind of core events for a number of years on the backs of some incredible volunteers. So again, I could name a, a handful of people that are just absolute rock stars in the history of this organization that have been doing it now since 1995. And so we are at a bit of a tipping point as an organization where uh, like the Larry McGrattans and Ian Martins and Terry Rickmans, Al Newsom, just naming a few names that I know some of you will know, they are kind of transitioning off the board and there's a bit of a new guard coming onto the board here. So we are, I mean, it makes for very exciting times and it makes for, you know, interesting times because some of us are pushing to do things differently than they've been done in the past. Uh, and we want to see the organization grow uh, you know, aggressively within reason. We want to do five tree plantings a year as opposed to one. We want to, you know, the, the fish stocking is great, but we'd like to do more stream restoration. We'd like to find the money that we can work with the ministry in order to do some of these EP projects in a more expedited manner. So there's a, you know, there's a real push now to bring on more appropriate skill sets from a, from a charitable lens. 
and bring all those other volunteers into committees of the board as opposed to being on the board. So as I mentioned earlier, like we, our board will outfish any board of any organization anywhere in the world. I truly believe that. These guys are amazing. I'm definitely the worst fisherman on the board. Um, but what we don't have is the marketing communications, the fundraising expertise, the legal support, the other things that in my professional world are the things that I focus on. So there's a mix of both that need to exist in this world because we need rock rollers and tree planters and fish carriers and I am one of those guys, but we also need some of that other kind of behind the scenes work to happen as well. So. We are always looking for more members. Uh, membership numbers have dwindled over the last number of years, which I think most fly fishing clubs are experiencing as well. Unfortunately, it's a bit of a you know tale of the times. There's a lot of a lot of gray hair in our rooms and in these presentation rooms that I present at. And I mean, hell, I got a lot of gray hair for only being 21 too. Right? <laughs> How old are your kids? <laughs> oh yeah, right. I kind of gave that away, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So you know, you know the old saying, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time to plant a tree is today, and that's kind of our focus. We want to do more now so that my kids will have a kind of different future than I have. And with the sense of the urgency around climate change and uh, the environmental factor and the younger generations uh, being more interested in environment, our focus in terms of engaging youth is now moving more towards the environmental side. And we have to remind ourselves all the time that our organization is not friends of the brown trout. We are friends of the Grand River. And there's a lot of work we can do that is not specific to brown trout. And so that's kind of our focus. And our goal is to keep doing what we're doing and do more, basically, at this point. So I think that is it from me. Oh, of course, a little bit of fish love. So. I tried to not show you guys fish pictures throughout because everyone gets distracted, but I'll end with that. <laughs>